Hello again, you're watching Al Jazeera. We've got some breaking news coming out of Turkey and Syria, places that are still reeling from two devastating earthquakes. Another earthquake has just struck near Antakya. The 6.4 magnitude quake shook buildings and was felt as far away as Beirut. Let's immediately go to our correspondent who's in Gaziantep in Turkey, Asad Beg. Asad, you also felt this quake. Tell us all about it. Well, we were about to go live, in fact, uh, just, just over half an hour ago. We felt the floor move the ground move we saw people running we were next to a petrol station the staff immediately ran out there's some police standing down the road again they again ran for some cover the building behind us that has been cordoned off already part of it uh, d destroyed because of the, f the first two earthquakes it began to shake the chandeliers inside you could see them shaking and then we began to hear reports of this earthquake. Now, we believe that it originated in Hatay around 6.4 on the Richter scale. We're also hearing reports of some destroyed buildings, uh, but unconfirmed at this point in time. But there have been thousands of aftershocks. Now, this is the first earthquake after those two initial ones, uh, initial earthquakes two weeks ago. And we have to remember there's been a considerable amount of destruction, uh, thousands of people dead, but also there are still buildings that are standing but have been damaged. Now, the fear is that if there are heavy aftershocks or earthquake, in fact, like this, it could bring down those uh, buildings that have been damaged, causing even further uh, damage to the area or even threat to life. Now, when this earthquake took place just uh, over half an hour ago, we had one of our producers here in Gaziantep Airport. Now, he said that the entire airport shook and people began to run. It created a sense of panic. We have someone else in Hatay Airport, and that airport was evacuated. So there's still this considerable fear uh, among people of possible strong aftershocks, but this earthquake definitely will really scare people. We've been speaking to people all week, and they've been talking about the psychological impact of those earthquakes and the sense of security that has been destroyed. Uh, and the authorities here will be concerned about those damaged buildings uh, and probably, you know, the, widening the cordon, as we've seen the police moving around here, thinking about widening the cordon around some of those damaged buildings. Mm. Uh, where are people who have lost their homes in the first earthquakes two weeks ago sheltering? Uh, is there anywhere that's actually safe? As you say, we're, you're experiencing aftershocks almost daily. So there are many people inside uh, tent cities, uh, so in open spaces like uh, football stadiums. Uh, so there's been uh, tent cities set up, but people have been moved out of the earthquake zone. Now, the President Recep Tayyip Erdogan was speaking earlier on today, and he said over 300,000 people have been moved out of the earthquake zone. So they've been put up in university dormitories, uh, state guest houses, uh, hotels uh, that are outside the zone. But there are still some people inside the cities, in tent cities, but others I've seen uh, refuse to move from outside of their building because they still have belongings in there and some are still waiting for uh, the bodies of their loved ones to be brought out. So what they've done is set up a tent outside the building uh, that was either damaged or destroyed. They have a fire going to keep themselves warm, uh, but those people will be under immediate risk if those buildings are to collapse. So it varies in terms of where people have been housed. Now, Recep Tayyip Erdogan said that 1.6 million people have found temporary accommodation. Uh, but there are still many people within cities like Gaziantep, like Karavan Marash, like Hatay, that are still in those cities within the earthquake zone. And again, it will be reliving that trauma, going that, that mm. sense of fear, especially when we've just had a strong earthquake, a 6.4. And this comes just a, a few hours after President Erdogan was in this region, making his second visit to the affected areas. He was making some big promises, wasn't he, to rebuild within a year. I mean, those promises seem a bit uh, fake, really, or a bit uh, distant when you're still getting aftershocks that are damaging further buildings. Absolutely. It, it is a huge and massive task ahead of him. He said, give me at least one year. And he said that they will rebuild. But... They have to remove that rubble. They have to bring down the damaged buildings and start from scratch. And he also said that they uh, won't have any buildings higher than four stories high. Now, he's, he's asked people to give him at least 
one year. He's, he's also said that there will be financial help for those affected in terms of destroyed apartments. There will be money given to people to help them with rent. There will be money given to people to help them move. But he's, he has a year. There is an election plan. There was an election plan for May. And if you speak to some people, there's considerable anger at the government in terms of how was this allowed to happen? Why did so many buildings collapse? Now, mm. we don't know if those elections will take place, but if you speak to some people, they believe he's asking for a year to not only rebuild confidence in the state, but also to rebuild uh, his popularity amongst the people. OK, Assad Beg joining us there from Gaziantep who felt the, the, the 6.4 earthquake that shook the area just uh, within the last hour. Let's speak now to Zaina Hodder because she's joining us from Beirut. That's another area where this earthquake was felt. Zaina, first of all, just tell us what you experienced there in the capital of Lebanon. Well, the tremor was quite strong and it lasted up to 15 seconds. Uh, people here are terrified. Many of them are now in the streets. People across Lebanon really felt those, those tremors. Initial reports suggest that what they felt was a five-magnitude earthquake. This was what they felt here. Now, two weeks ago, um, following that major earthquake on February the 6th in central Turkey, um, buildings here shook. So it was very similar to what happened back then. And the trauma, the anxiety is still fresh in, in people's minds. And many are, are concerned because a lot of the buildings across the country really are not structurally sound. Many of them are old, dating back to the days of the Civil War, damaged. And worry because successive governments have really not done anything to enforce standards. Um, building, building standards. So people are in the streets, they're concerned. And this is a country which has, uh, you know, seen its share of disasters. Two and a half years ago, there was a massive explosion at the port of Beirut. Um, that trauma still as well fresh in the minds of the people here. Um, in, recent, uh, in recent days, the government um, uh, carried out inspections in the, in the north of the country and singled out hundreds of buildings in, in the city of Tripoli, uh, which were not structurally sound. So that, those, that, that tremor was felt. It was a strong tremor. People are terrified, and uh, many are now in the streets. And, Zaina, you've been speaking to people in northern Syria, again, an area that was devastated by those twin earthquakes two weeks ago. The death toll standing at over 5,000 people there, many thousands more homeless, an area that's proving very, very difficult to get to uh, with aid and help. But tell us what people there have been telling you in the wake of this recent earthquake that happened just in the past hour. Yes, we are hearing um, from our contacts on the ground that some buildings have, have collapsed mm. in two towns, Janderis, um and Salkin. Janderis was um, among the hardest hit towns during the February 6 earthquake. So some of the, those buildings have now collapsed and we're also getting reports that five people have been injured in another town, Atarib, that's also in, in, in the north of the country. A very vulnerable region. Many of the buildings um, were damaged during the course of the 12-year war, uh, not structurally sound, and even very poor building standards. Uh, so the majority of the people are now living in tents, no doubt. They left those buildings that were damaged. But this is going to um, create even more fear and anxiety to a population which is just struggling to survive. Four million people live in this corner of Syria. It's controlled by the opposition. Two million cannot survive without aid. And that was before the February 6 earthquake. Aid has begun to arrive, but there has been no really coordinated international response, unlike in government-controlled areas. Uh, you talk to doctors in hospitals, and they tell you that we are overwhelmed. We cannot treat the injured. We have many crush injuries, which means we need to provide kidney dialysis sessions to more patients. 
um, because crush injuries uh, are could have fatal consequences, yet they don't have the necessary equipment to do so. Uh, they're talking about bandages. They lack bandages. They lack doctors. Um, so there, there, there's an emergency in hospital. There's an emergency in, in, in tense cities where, you know, people have lost their livelihoods. Uh, 8, 10,000 people in all of Syria were injured, 8,000, 8, uh, a little bit over 8,000 in, in the opposition-controlled north. So all these people need treatment, need care. So now with this new tremor, new earthquake, more buildings collapsing, uh, more injuries, um, this is just going to cause uh, more suffering to, to a people who have been used to years of death, destruction and displacement. Zaina, with that many people needing access, what is happening on the international front to try to negotiate access to these areas uh, through Damascus? Well, the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, a few days ago, um, approved cross-line deliveries, which means that the international community, the United Nations, will be able to deliver aid from government-controlled areas into opposition-controlled areas. Now, the opposition was alarmed by this. What they were saying was they don't want to be hostages, yet again, of a regime that they do not consider legitimate. Um, they believe that Bashar al-Assad was trying to exploit uh, the, the, the tragedy by controlling the entry points or controlling what aid reaches the people. What the opposition wanted was for the international community to bring aid from, from, um, from Turkey through cross-border deliveries. A few days later, the Syrian president did give his approval to open two more crossings apart from the Bab al-Hawa crossing, which has been used by the United Nations for, for a few years now. Um, but as we all know, southern Turkey has been devastated. A lot of the aid agencies, um, you know, they were trying to pick up the pieces th th themselves. So this is not going to be an easy task for aid to reach uh, the, the northern part of Syria. But most of the aid has been arriving at government-controlled airports in Damascus, in, in, in Aleppo. So it's a, logist a logistical nightmare, really, for aid agencies to reach the people in the northwest corner of Syria, ice, people who are isolated, people who, who are really relying on the support of Turkey, uh, which today needs international support following uh, the, devastating, the devastating earthquakes. And the biggest concern now among people in northwest Syria is not just about surviving. It's not just about getting food and, and, and medical aid. They are seeing a man, the president of Syria, who they accuse of or who was responsible for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths, uh, slowly inching his way back on the international stage. Um, it has just been reported that he is in Oman visiting uh, a second Arab country. Um, a, a year back, he was in the United Arab Emirates. So Arab countries are now opening up to re-engaging uh, with, with Bashar al-Assad. So these people are not just worried, worried about survival. They're worried about the politics. What, what will their fate be if the, if, if the Arab world or, or part of the international community re-engage with Bashar al-Assad without resolving their fate because they cannot and will not live under his rule? So as you can imagine, all, all these uh, problems compounded after years and years of conflict and, 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 and crisis after crisis. OK, Zaina, thanks very much indeed for bringing us the latest from Beirut. These are pictures, just to remind you, if you're just joining us from Hatay in Turkey. Also seeing pictures from Adana in southern Turkey, where a major 6.4 earthquake has just shaken the region, an earthquake that was felt across southern Turkey, as well as Syria, Lebanon and Egypt. No reports of further casualties yet, but there have been reports of further damage to buildings that have already been devastated by the two earthquakes two weeks ago. We'll be keeping across this and coming back to it later in the show.